This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software used by over 10 million people. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash know how. Today on Know How, your questions are answers. Maybe. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballasar. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be collecting the dragon balls of knowledge to summon the eternal knowledge dragon. <laughs> You've been watching some Dragon Ball Z, I haven't have. you? Actually, no, I've been watching Dragon Ball Z Abridged by Team Four Star. Having heard what you told me, I need to watch that. It's, it, oh, imagine taking Dragon Ball Z and taking mm-hmm. out all the time they spend powering up a screen. Ah! Ah, which there would be nothing left, the, right? But what's left is delicious. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's great. Because you can finish the whole series in 15 minutes. But yeah, well, like, you, they take the movies, because they've done several Dragon Ball Z movies, and yeah. you take out all the screaming and the powering up, and you go from, like, a, an hour and a half movie to a 30-minute movie. And it's awesome. It's, right. it's so much condensed. And, and you realized, yeah, they added a lot of filler, mm-hmm. because when they were making the series, they had to wait for the manga. Oh, that's why, that why. That's why there's always these like, why oh. is it taking forever to power up? Well, because it was a weekly series <laughs> and the manga maybe didn't come out. <laughs> okay, okay, I did not know that, but yeah, I'd love to go back and watch the abridged version. It's pretty good. Cool. It's pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, so knowledge balls. Yeah, come folks, out of go to YouTube right after this episode and go watch Dragon Ball Abridged. In fact, I would suggest mm-hmm. starting with the movie. No, no, go to the short. It's a two-minute short of Cell. Mm-hmm versus uh, What's-His-Face from Fist of the North Star. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the It's name. like Ryu Ken or something. Okay. And it's two minutes long on YouTube? Yeah. And okay. you know, there's also Cell versus Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go fast. <laughs> Gotta go fast. <laughs> but we're not here to talk about crazy anime and their parodies. This is a feedback show, which means we're going to be looking at some of the questions that you've been putting into our Google Plus group in order to, well, answer what you need. Brian, we've got a first one. Uh, this is actually a very common question. I, I get mm-hmm. this a lot in emails. People telling me that, oh, they love the Synology that I recommended, so they bought one, but they bought the bare chassis, right. and now they're looking at what kind of drives to fill it up with. It, yeah. Does it matter? Is it important? Should they buy the highest performance drive they can possibly find? But we've got one from Ben Reese who has a very specific question. I'm thinking about a NAS build in my future and wondering about drive options. Is it better to use cheaper drives like the WD or blue with more protection with two drive redundancy or red, which are more expensive drives with less protection? Prices are pretty close. Four times three terabyte reds is $440 versus five times three terabyte blue drives, which equals out to $450. So it's more of a factor of which would last longer or be safer. Follow-up or related, are the green drives found in WD My Passport the same as the green drives you buy bare? It's odd, but sometimes portable drives are cheaper than internal drives. All very good questions, yeah. and let's go ahead and answer them in, in order. The first is, again, what drive should I get for my NAS? Mm-hmm. And this this is one of these things where you know, people have asked me, can I get like the Western Digital Blacks? Uh, which are the 10,000 RPM ones that are super fast performance. Or do I go with something like the WD Greens, which Mm -hmm. are less expensive, they're quieter. Well, let's let's first of all look at the basic difference. So when I'm talking about the the Blacks, again, that's super high performance. Right, that's the one I used to use for my, the instance that I ran Windows on until I got an SSD and I haven't gone back to an old hard drive like that. Precisely, the Black has basically been superseded by SSD. If you're gonna spend that much money on storage, you just get the SSD because it is ridiculous faster than even the fastest hard drive, right. which again is probably going to be the Western Digital well, Black. It's one side note, we kind of had an off-the-air discussion with Ryan Shrout the other day about how 
<laughs> we let our Windows like 10 instances last. Right. We don't re yeah. reformat because we don't the have SSD yeah, makes it so that you don't have to. Yeah. yeah, it used to be if you had a Windows installation on a hard drive, eventually it would get so mucked up and the registry would get so bloated mm -hmm. that it just takes forever to load. Well, we don't really notice that anymore because SSDs are so fast yeah. that that's not the bottleneck. So like I actually my home PC, I probably should reinstall Windows. It's probably been like four years or something like that, but but since I upgraded to an SSD, it's not as noticeable, so I'm like, eh, I don't want to install my programs again. Same thing with this, this uh, this Acer S7 that I've used, oh my gosh, it's only five years. Dang. Uh, it's the original installation, because I don't take this to DEF CON, I've got that other one for, for DEF CON, so, yeah. uh, and I just looked at uh, the, the disk manager, there's four more partitions on this than I thought there were, because <laughs> when it's done the various upgrades, because this started at Windows 8, then went 8.1, then oh. went 10, then went back, then went to 10, then went back, then went to 10. <laughs> it, yep. it, it added a bunch of temporary partitions mm -hmm. that are still there. So there's actually like two two gigabytes on this machine. That could be free, that, that are just, just backed yeah, partitions. Like system reserved. Yeah. So I, I should probably reformat this. But like you said, since this SSD is so crazy fast, I don't really notice it. But uh, as far as NASes, you could do an SSD, but we're talking volume yeah. over Yeah, so volume, speed. it's not going to be black. It's probably not going to be SSD. Green, so the green Western Digital Series, I really like them. They're, they're the ones that we use for backup drives here. They're lower, lower, not low, but lower cost. Mm -hmm. They run at 5,400 RPM, or actually might be even lower than that. So they're quiet. They're very energy efficient. Mm -hmm. The blue, blue has become sort of, that's the normal hard drive that's okay like, you know, kind of the middle in in the middle of everything doesn't Correct. isn't the fastest but also uses a little bit more power than the green right right and then there's the red and the red are specifically made for nas for storage applications they've got a couple of things that that make it so the first is that wd red supports what's called t l e r that's hmm. time limited error recovery so in every hard drive the firmware has a, a sequence of instructions that tells it how long to wait before giving up on a sector. Hmm. So if it reads an error, there's, like it says, no, try this for this amount of time and then give up. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, if you're gonna be running it in a, an application where you've got multiple drives storing the same information, which you do in a RAID, yeah. it's not as important for the drive to, to have that because you've actually got a way to do error correcting in the NAS. In fact, Having error correcting both in the hard drive and in the NAS can be bad because now you have competing error correction and you get mm. this weird state where basically like the NAS corrects it this way, the hard drive corrects it that way, the NAS corrects it this way, the hard, and it just keeps going back and forth. Huh, okay. So TLER allows the user, or in this case the NAS, to set what that is. And basically what the NAS says is, hey, you know what? Give up immediately. I'll take care of it. Okay. So this can vastly increase the speed and the reliability of your network attached storage box. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, the the way a traditional hard drive works too is it's the head that goes over the spinning plate. So, how is it that like a file would get corrupted or there would be an error? It's it, just, it, it, just, it, it just can't read. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it could be anything from the magnetic polarity of that particular bit just got too weak, mm -hmm. or it could be that there's debris. Which yeah, is worst case scenario, bad, that's yeah. the super, super bad. Or it could just be a bad read. Uh, but in an application like a NAS, like let's take my Synology NAS, which I love so much, mm -hmm. there's actually hardware. It's not software. There's hardware built in that does that. So it, it's actually faster for the NAS box to do, to it, do it than for the hard drive to try oh, okay. to do it. Okay. Yeah. So the TLER is a good thing. However, there's something that's more important than that. What? It's all about the temps. Now here's a little video that I did a while back showing you what the various temperatures look like. So on, on the left, we've got a Seagate Barracuda. That's a 7200 RPM hard drive. That's typical. This is what you would get in like the blue series. This one at room temperature, running for a while, is running around 90 degrees. Okay. Okay, 90 degrees, that's, that's not bad. It's not super hot. No. The green is cooler because it's more efficient, about 84, 85 degrees, but the red, the red is gonna run you about 75 degrees. It's a full 10 wow. degrees cooler than the green, a full 15 degrees cooler than the standard Barracuda. And as we know from prior experience, heat eventually leads to the death of a lot of uh, inside components for a PC. Absolutely. And those are just sitting still on a desk. Yep. So yep. if there's air circulating through a case or something, you could see probably cold, uh, cooler temperatures than that. You can see cooler temperatures, but you have to remember inside of a NAS, it's they are be, packed together. Yeah, that's true. And it, so, I mean, the it's not just 15 <laughs> degrees difference. It is the accumulated 15 degrees difference running 20 
24-7. Right, right. Um, I have never, ever, since I started putting red drives, and that was five years ago or so when they first came out, yeah. I've never lost a red. Wow. Ever. Huh. Because they run so much cooler. It's just, it's a cumulative effect. I have lost so many Seagate 7200 RPM hard drives, yes. and I have lost green drives in NASs. It's, it's just the fact that in such an enclosed area, anything you can do to not greatly ramp up the amount of heat that those drives are going to suffer, mm -hmm. it's going to in increase the longevity of your system. And not to sound like a Western digital fanboy, because I, I don't have a ton of experience with other hard drives, but it seems to me, I've probably gone through a dozen hard drives in my life, and only one of them has ever failed, and it yeah. was a Seagate, and yeah. that was enough for me to be like, well, I guess I'm going to do Western digital now, and I haven't had one fail since. It, it's, it's one of those uh, tragic sort of right? trauma-inducing events when you lose a hard drive and you didn't have a backup. I, just, I mean... It doesn't matter. It could be the, the best rated hard drive ever. If you happen to get the one that went down, it will forever tarnish that name in your, in your mind. And for me, it was Hitachi. Uh, Hitachi Mac Store. Yeah. I, I lost several drives, and it took down really important information. This is before I, I learned proper backup etiquette. Well, all it takes is once, right? Because uh, after that Seagate died on me, I have tripled my backup. I, I will go as far as to say, I've never lost a Seagate drive. Not uh. once. And this is going back to like the IDE days. Yeah, I get it. it all comes down to just odds and chances yeah, and stuff. I just got but lucky. yeah, my, my my use case was a Seagate, and after that happened, I moved. I went to the Western Digital Black for my main PC, and I didn't use anything else yeah. for a long time. There you go. So what I will say is the red is absolutely worth it. I know it's a little more more expensive, but I mean when you look at how valuable the data is versus how expensive the drive is, there really is no no comparison. Now one other thing that you can do, and you can do this with both QNAP and with Drobo and with Synology mm -hmm. devices, I can set aside one bay to act as the SSD cache. So I can put an SSD in there and it will cache the RAID array. Okay. Uh, if you have a chance, do that because that's amazing. <laughs> well, that, that acts just like a hybrid drive, right? Yeah. So the, one of the questions wasn't um, using a hybrid drive. I forget which... Uh, Western Digital makes a hybrid, right? With an they SSD do. and then a spinning... And so does Seagate, yeah. So what if you use that in a RAID setup? Would a, a RED would probably still be a better option. Yeah, uh, uh, that... Mm, no, because it, it, that puts the cache on the drive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not super, super efficient because we've got to remember those drives are still in a RAID array. Right. The whole idea of the RAID array is it has bare level command control over the drives inside of it. I Anytime see. you add a layer of complexity, there's always a chance that some weird interaction is going to take place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, one other thing. If you do buy red, don't use them as desktop drives. You would use a green or a blue as a desktop drive. The problem is if that TLER gets set too low, you basically just told the drive, don't ever try to do error recovery. Oh, uh, that's a really good way to corrupt files. <laughs> good to know. Good yeah, to don't know. Do that, don't do that. All right. All right, we got one more about network security. Uh, this is this is a, actually a really good question. This is something that's sort of applied from all the networking 101, 102 episodes that we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot on the security stuff that we've done here at Twit. But we had Technical Terry, <laughs> nice name by the way, who uh, wanted a little bit of advice. So Technical Terry asks, need some network security advice. I am in charge of a video for large live corporate events. At the end of episode 312, Padre mentioned the TriCaster and its vulnerability since it runs an older version of Windows. And it's not easy to upgrade or update. This got me thinking about our setup. We have a switcher, not a TriCaster, and a playback slash replay server, which both run an older version of Windows. All the equipment needs <laughs> to be networked all of this equipment needs to be networked together. Some just for control won't really work without a laptop control with the gear, and most others for file transfer still store records and transcoding. However, we also utilize outside freelancers from time to time, and we work with many different clients. Our freelancers tend to have their own laptops and prefer to use them, while clients are always giving us USB drives and flash memory for file transferring. What kind of advice might you have for all of this in, uh, in this kind of environment? Anyone from Twit Engineering or someone with similar setups, how do we best avoid things like WannaCry uh, on systems that can't be updated or something like uh, bad USB? Well, bad 
bad USB, there's nothing you can do about bad no. USB. No, uh, and bad <laughs> USB will affect OS X, Windows, and Linux. And so yeah. I, uh, most of us have just kind of tried to put it out of our mind. It doesn't exist it's anymore. Not, no, it's yeah. not, a, not a thing. Uh, but great, great question. Actually, this, this is sort of the culmination of some of the things that we've been trying to teach to the know-how audience. Yeah. Proper security practice for the network. Now, the old... The old way of thinking about this was called perimeter security. In other words, mm -hmm. I put a wall around my network, and everyone inside is a good guy, and everyone outside <laughs> is a bad guy. You can trust everybody you on can, the inside, yeah. for sure. And we did that. I mean, that, you, we can make fun of it now, but that was the standard mm -hmm. even five years ago. Uh, people just assumed that you could buy a really nice firewall, and you could keep all the bad stuff out. Well. We've changed. Yeah. We've, we've gone, we're post-perimeter security. We now understand that we need what are called security zones. In other words, you can't assume that everyone behind the wall is a good guy. In fact, you have to assume that there are bad guys inside the castle. Mm -hmm. You have to assume that there are a couple of computers that are vulnerable, that have been exploited, that someone will do something stupid like clicking on a link that <laughs> contains WannaCry, yep. that someone will have a USB that has a virus or a Trojan that gets uploaded to a Linux box or a Mac. You know, yeah. These are the things that you just assume are happening, and that's the right way to do it. You have to right. assume. Assume it's bad. So uh, kudos to you for thinking about that vulnerable equipment. That is the first step. Look through your network inventory and figure out if anything gets attacked here, where is it going to hurt the most and what equipment is most vulnerable. You need to know your weaknesses before you can prep a defense. Right. right. In, in his case, he knows he's got a couple, he's got a switcher running Windows, mm -hmm. probably Windows embedded, so it's probably like seven or even XP. Uh, he knows that he's got control systems that need to network to that switcher, so he can't just pull the plug, because no. that's the best defense, the best defense is air <laughs> gap, just don't yeah. let it talk to anything. Uh, and then he also knows that, well, there's risk factors, I've got people who need to be able to access that network because they need to be able to put files that the switcher can read. Right. Or he's got freelancers who want to bring their own computers into the network and uh, they want to give you strange USB drives. Yeah. The wonderful thing here is this is actually quite simple to figure out. What you need is something like the three dumb router setup that we, we did on uh, Networking 102. Right. A, Steve a Gibson talked about. Steve Gibson talked about it. Uh, it doesn't have to be three routers. It could be VLANs. If, if you're in a big enough company, your switch probably supports VLAN. So what you need is to be able to uh, support segmenting the various users. So you, have, you start with the trusted network. And the trusted network is the one where nothing goes on to except the devices that you specifically allow. So for example, okay. the switcher, the control systems, and the storage. Right. So that's the trusted network. In other words, uh, I, I can trust that those will never be owned because nobody on the trusted network ever does anything that's not related to switching. Right, and people shouldn't be plugging things just at random into those yeah. devices. Not only should they not be plugging things in, you should make it impossible for them to plug in. <laughs> like, don't <laughs> like, even give them the option to accidentally plug in something to that network. Right. Because we know from our work with WannaCry, if someone has an infected Windows 7 laptop and they plug it into that network, it will start pinging the network. To find out what else is there. And if it finds a Windows 7 installation that hasn't been updated in forever, it will infect it. That's okay. what it does. Okay. <laughs> then you go one step down and you can talk about, not, it's not trusted, but it is the friendly network. <laughs> so the friendly network would be like the people who work in-house. Right. They need access to the internet they need access to the shared storage because they need to be able to give files over to the the uh, the switcher, right? Right. So maybe the maybe that shared storage is the one device that can cross over networks. So you, right. you set up the VLANs so everyone can see it. It just has to be a really good storage box, mm -hmm. something that's protected against attacks, something that doesn't have any exploits, and something that you regularly patch. Okay. I would suggest the Synology. The Synology is really good at that, and you can dual dual or try, or actually they have a version with four, you could four home uh, that box. So you could have it connected to four different networks. Oh, okay. Uh, and then you can set the rules inside the box. You can say, okay, this network gets to copy files off but not copy anything on. Mm -hmm. This network can read everything, and this network over here can only see what's there but not actually interact with the content. I mean, okay. that's the sort of rules that you can create. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great way to kind of like sterilize which machines are interacting yep. with each other. Yep. Okay. And then you have the last network, and that is the untrusted network. <laughs> that's where you is would that put, the Wild West? That's that's the awesome. while you just assume that everything on the untrusted network is busted. Okay. okay. But what you do is you give that network access to the internet. Mm -hmm. It cannot see anything on the friendly network. 
and it cannot see anything on the trusted network. The mm -hmm. one thing it can see is that storage server. Again, because we're assuming you're protecting your storage server. Right. So that they can give you the files and they can use their computers, their Macs, to, to copy files into the storage server that will be used by the switcher. Okay. Now, now all of that, that works really well. The one weak point is gonna be that storage server. You yeah. have to make sure that storage server is always patched and you have to make sure that storage server is always watched. Well, you were talking also, I don't think it was this episode, but a prior one with NASA's where you, I asked you, how long do you hang on to a NAS for? And you said, till end of life. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean end of life? You're like, when they stop patching it, yeah. I have to go to the next one, yeah. Precisely, and that's, you gotta be thinking the same thing. Uh, the other nice thing about a Synology NAS is you can set it so it will auto update. Mm. So it, like, it will go, oh, I found a new update. Okay, I will update at four o'clock in the morning. Every time there's a new update, I will just pull it down on my own and up, update myself at 4 a.m. That's a good setup. Mm. That, that works really, really well. Um, and I mean, I prefer locked down. So I would even go the extra step of telling someone, hey, if you're on the, the untrusted network, you don't even get access to the storage server. So you can have access to the, to the internet you can have access to all the stuff on the untrusted network, but if you want to get something into the, the switcher, yeah. it's got to go through someone who, who is part of the trusted network. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Good and, way. Yeah. So there you have it. Super easy to say, kind of difficult to implement it. Again, because you didn't tell me what kind of equipment you have access to, I can't specifically tell you how to do it, but that's how I would do it. Okay, well, you gave him the basics so he could probably implement that, those practices with the equipment he has. So. Yeah, hope so. As close as we're going to get. Yeah. If you, if you want to give us more information, uh, I'll be happy to take it up in August because this is, this is one of my favorite topics. And, <laughs> Networking uh, well, and you? Yeah. Oh, I've got Alex. Sorry, Alex, is, he's our engineer. Yeah, I'm just going to chime in here about the TriCaster in particular and possibly any other Windows-based switchers. Is NewTek has told us that uh, you can install security updates, uh, Windows updates, uh, but only the security-based ones and not the feature updates or whatever else. But, yeah. but you can still go to Windows Update if you have it. If you don't have it because it's Windows embedded and it's, that's not there, you can go to the website and download the security updates. Uh, okay. And there you okay. go. It, it's, it's important to read those bulletins. Those bulletins that come in, I know it looks super dense, but there's occasionally some very important information in that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, uh, yeah, you need to download this right now because this is an active attack. That's, yeah, do it. That's, yes, please. Thank please. You. Yeah. Please update. <laughs> Let's take a moment for these messages. We'll continue with uh, know-how in just a moment, but I'm going to interrupt because I have to talk about something I used for so long. Saved my life. Fresh books. Fresh books. So when I was, uh, when I was working in Canada, a freelancer going up once a month for a week to do TV shows up there, uh, the way it worked is I had to invoice Rogers for my time, and I had to expense my travel and my hotel and my food. And, you know, that meant I was out of pocket up front, but I hated doing invoices so much I would forget, you know, forget to do invoices for months, which means I'd really be out of pocket. And it didn't make Rogers very happy. I remember, <laughs> I remember going to the studio one day saying, I'm really in trouble. The accountant said that... that if I keep sending them six months' worth of invoices in one fell swoop, they're going to not pay me. And Amber said, Leo, fresh books. This was a brand new startup. This is about 2004. Brand new startup in Toronto. And awesome. They made it very easy to make invoices. They did the currency conversions. They convert from any currency to any currency. You take a picture with the uh, Fresh Books app of your expenses, your receipts and stuff. Put them right in the invoice. If you bill for time and hours, they have a button on the website or a button on the app that you just start the timer. You can even assign uh, hours to different projects, different customers, obviously. It's just awesome. And here's the thing I learned. If you don't send a bill, you don't get paid. On average, FreshBooks users get paid 11 days faster. I think part of that is your client wants to pay you, but you got to make it easy for them. So with the FreshBooks invoice, there's a button on it that says, pay Leo. Well, in your case, it'll say pay you. And they press it and they can pay with a whole, but they don't, you don't have to set up anything. They don't have to set up anything. They could pay with a credit card or a whole different bunch of, you know, all the main uh, online payment services. It makes it so easy for clients. That's why you get paid. I'm convinced that's why you get paid faster. And it's a full accounting system. So you don't need to know this. In fact, I hate to even say that because that sounds scary. But if you look at the FreshBooks dashboard, you'll know exactly where you stand. Because they're doing expenses, accounts receivable, they have all the reports you need. You know, for instance, something that I never knew. Have you made a profit? 
it's right there. What's your profit? What's your loss? It, when it comes to tax time, you've got all the reports, the standard reports you can give to your accountant so they can do your taxes, sales tax, summary, profit and loss, all of that. Maybe you want to you know, get take investors. You've got all the proper paperwork, but you didn't do it. You don't have to do it. FreshBooks does it automatically. All you have to do is do your invoices, and that's easy. In a minute, you can make it beautiful, professional-looking invoice. If people don't pay you, they can send automatic reminders. You can even set it up. The, there's auto invoicing and auto payments, recurring payments. Try it out. It works with Stripe, Shopify, Gusto, Acuity Scheduling, all the stuff you're already using, and the new FreshBooks dashboard. It is awesome. Ten, since I started using it, it's become huge. Ten million people now use FreshBooks. Ten million people. It was included in the Forbes Small Giants list for 2017. Not so small. They're doing great, and you ought to be using them. Go to freshbooks.com slash knowhow, and you could try it free for 30 days. Do put knowhow in the how did you hear about us section just so, you know, the guys get credit. Freshbooks.com slash knowhow. It really works. It's really great. Now we take you back to the evil geniuses of knowhow. Thanks. And we are back. Let's go ahead and finish it off with a little bit more feedback. We've got one from... Ken, who actually was doing one of our, our projects that we love so much, the Steampunk Goggles, and he had a question. All right, so Ken asked, Steampunk Goggle version 2 question. I ordered all the parts yesterday, but I didn't see the battery listed on the show page. Anyone have a link to the battery? I know what connector it uses, but does the size matter? I also had to get the pro potentiometers from Amazon, and I think I matched them up correctly. This is a great project to get me and my nine-year-old son building. Yes, yes, and that's thank you because that's exactly what we did. I mean, we want a lot of these projects that we do, they don't have a lot of practical use, but the whole idea is to <laughs> get you into the love of tinkering. Very little of what we do on this show has a practical use. Yeah. But we, we did like we building. did one project for someone in a nursing home. I think that was probably the only useful thing we've ever created. That yeah, that's true. Yeah. But you know what? A lot of these projects too are fun to do with someone else. Yes, you are. know, like uh, we've done the solder off project with these these goggles. I haven't finished my goggles, but you know, it was still fun to do it together. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were at Maker Fair, and mm -hmm. Maker actually gave us a table, so we were to come in and, and meet some of the fans. Mm -hmm. I, I totally think uh, we should do that for know-how. We just like bring a bunch of our projects, bring yeah. a, like a bunch of soldering stations, just say, hey, you know what? Come sit down, have a soda, have some water chips and just solder with us play with us find yeah. find the gear that we have and because we want to inspire people to make stuff definitely um more like uh the hardware hacking stuff that yeah. we see at, at defcon def yeah, like exactly. that's the most fun i've had at defcon was just sitting around at the table soldering stuff and meeting people yeah because i mean like the talks they're good mm -hmm. but you can get them online you yeah. can find the information online what you cannot replace from a conference or a show like maker fair or defcon is actually sitting down with people who have like interests, mm -hmm. who uh, who are willing to learn from you and maybe are willing to give you some of the information that you want. Right. That's that's right there. If we could do just do that, that's the ultimate know-how. And also, what I think we gleaned from going to Maker Fair was that anything with LEDs attracts people, yes, even if does. they don't know who you are. <laughs> just people walking up, being like, hey. "What is this? Can I have it?" <laughs> I actually, uh, the, so I went. I continued going because we Twit only went on Friday. I went Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. and I had at least two dozen people. People saying, uh, "Hey, would you buy your goggles?" And buy. Go and then I, Do you I know get where my you car. Are? And I'm like, well, we show people how to make them, and they go, "Oh, <laughs> shoot!" But I was really, you hoping. sell me yours? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like no, um, that's not how it works. Yeah, sorry, bro. Yeah, yeah you got to earn those goggles. <laughs> but you don't have to earn the batteries, Ken. Uh, actually, what I would suggest is any battery that would fit into a, a SEMA powered quadcopter or remote control device right. will work in this. In fact, because it's using uh, that um, uh, the, the little uh, SEMA connector, yeah. there are multiple capacities that you can get. The first one I would suggest, because it is the cheapest, is this. We've got a link for this for four batteries mm -hmm. and a charger. So these are 600 milliamp. They fit just fine into the housing. In fact, I don't think there's a battery using this, this, this connector style that won't fit into the housing. I, I designed that thing pretty big. Hmm. You can get four of them plus the charger for about $13 delivered. That's not bad, that, that no. works really well. Now, if you're looking for something a bit more, maybe get this one. This hmm. is the X6A. Same connector, they look the same. There's a difference. Instead of four batteries, there's six. Four and instead of 600 milliamp hour, it's 750 milliamp hour. Um, I, I don't use these on my my, uh, my little SEMA quadcopters because they're too heavy. But uh. if it's in the goggles, 
it that extra 150 milliamp hours that gives you like an extra two hours. Of that was going to be my next question. Was, I want to use them in, in my Sima. Yeah. No. No. I mean, you could. It, but it, the weight sluggish. Yeah. Kind of sluggish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. The, the thing is, though, that's twice as expensive. Yeah. Uh, so you get two more batteries and higher capacity batteries, but it costs twice as much. So your call. So if I want to use the batteries and fly my Sima, I should just get two of the the first one that you showed. Get yeah. double up. Yeah. Get eight batteries at 600 milliamps. Yeah, that works. You fly all day yeah. until you destroy your quad. Well, because you know this, because we when you put the really small batteries into those Simas, they scream. They do, yeah. But then they only fly for three minutes. Yeah. You put the the larger batteries, and they might fly for it's five, luggage. six minutes, but they're mm. so many compromises. It's like mm. an airborne corgi. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just weighed down with that big booty. <laughs> I want to right. go fast. Let's do one more. We got an easy one from Steven Reitman. <laughs> All right, so Steven asks, just watched the steampunk goggles. Does anyone know what the soldering ring Padre is using, and where is the best place to get one? We've answered this question so many times, and we still keep answering because That we're it's not going to answer it. Oh, we're no, going to... No, oh, we, we are? are? Totally good. Yeah. We're good. We're you good lucked guys. out, Steve, because next time, we only answer things three times, and that's it. No. <laughs> uh, what I was using was the Zenny 3-in-1. We've got a link for this. This is not that expensive. I mean, you can normally pay upwards of six to $800 for a decent soldering station. I bought this because it was inexpensive, but it has turned out to be fantastic. I've got two of these now, and plus one in storage, mm -hmm. uh, just in case. I have not, none of them have ever broken. They are perfect. They include the, uh, uh, the digital soldering iron, so that's digitally set, so mm -hmm. I can set what temperature I want exactly. It includes a hot air rework gun, which is not just good for reworking, but it's also good for, say, heat shrink tubing. Or and then it has, up, uh, uh, what are they, pizza bites. Oh, pizza bites, so you yeah. can do pizza bites. <laughs> and it also includes a DC power supply, so you, could, you can use this. <laughs> this is the ideal device to have on your workbench. And it's it's eighty six dollars. And I think someone on our crew may have also got. Was it that one that you got? It was yeah. that one. So you, he's not only a fan of the show, but he's bought one of the things that we it's talked like about. Club for men. <laughs> Are you doing right now? Is that is that the thing? Uh, I'm not only a fan of this soldering rig. I'm a user. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that I like about that is they include all the little bits. That you need. There are mm -hmm, other mm -hmm. soldering kits you can buy out there that you'll then need to buy sixty dollars worth of accessories. They include like eight different tips for the hot air gun, so you can go from the big rectangular one, mm -hmm. which is like general heating. When yeah, you want to perfect heat for the pizza bites. Right, pizza mm -hmm. bites to the like the one that looks like a tiny little straw. It's a pipette, right. pet. and that's when you're like doing very directional hot air reflowing. Yeah. So I know. Hal, when you when you did your project, it was soldering very tiny LEDs, like surface, surface mount stuff. stuff. Yeah. How did it work for you? It worked pretty out well? pretty good, yeah. I used a little yeah. tiny, tiny tip. And that was like your first project, was it? Pretty much. Yeah. Oh, so that reminds me. Good for beginners. Alex uh, Alex aced his surface mount test. Uh, you <laughs> haven't done yours yet. Yes, mine worked. <clears throat> Uh, instead of talking about that, how, how did you pronounce his name correctly, finally? Excuse me, Padre, it's... Pro oh, wait, you got it. <laughs> oh, folks, we know that this has been a lot of information, and we want to make sure that you have the links and all the information you need to decipher what we just did. Yes. Brian, where did they find that? You can find those over at twit.tv slash kh. And like Padre said, you'll find the links to all the things we talked about today. So those batteries, you'll be able to find a link for that. The, the soldering rig, you'll find uh, where you can get that and also if you've ever missed an episode you're gonna want to download or subscribe and you'll find ways to do that there yeah uh, also don't forget that you can find us on the socials it's this new thing they call the internet it's awesome <laughs> you're so hip Padre. I am so you don't even know it the but kids <laughs> call it the socials <laughs> <laughs> but you can find us specifically in the socials called Google Plus if you go to Google Plus and look for know-how we've got a actually very active probably the most not probably the most active group at Twit I okay I was gonna say on Google Plus and I was, I was gonna say no. I don't know if that's like even the high bar anymore because no. as far as socials go that's does anyone use Google Plus well put it this way we could use Facebook and have a much larger audience yeah what I like about Google Plus is if they're there it's there they're there because they they're, actually want to be part of the group. they're dedicated yeah and it's a great way for sharing projects and yeah. pictures and stuff yeah. Yeah. and we've got over over 11,000 kitas those are our know-it-alls mm -hmm. you folk who can Maybe ask for help with projects. Maybe you've got advice you can give to the new folk. Or maybe you just want to give us pictures, videos, descriptions of the projects that you're doing so we can put them here on Know How. Again, go to Google Plus and ask to join 
no help. Very short approval process because we got to keep out the spam accounts. But, that's yeah, right. That's a good place. Uh, but if you want to find us on other socials and to see what we're doing on upcoming episodes or when we go to Maker Faire or things like that and you want to find out where our booth is because I know somebody yeah. <laughs> was able to find us yeah. through Twitter. Eventually. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And we've got a third <laughs> member of our group who, <laughs> whose names I forgot again. Uh, who likes to brag about his surface mounts. I, I think I th here at the network, we call him he who must not be named. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's 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 the guy who pushes our buttons, and he's he's a good guy. You're gonna find him at twitter.com slash a n e l. Excuse me, Padre. It's pronounced Alex. I prefer he who shall. Not be. <laughs> <laughs> same thing. Yeah, same same thing. thing. Uh, until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, keep asking questions. Do it. Do it, but not more than three times. No.